I am Justin Gatlin. This is Ready, Set, Go. Ready, Set, Go. Welcome back with Justin Gatlin, myself, Rodney A. Green II. We're going to jump right into origin story, man. Where it all began, where it all started. Before Justin Gatlin, just Justin. Well, before we start, I want to say to all the audience, thank you so much for uh, tuning in, locking in. Uh, we really appreciate it. Stay locked in, stay tuned. We're ready, set, go, and all the haters, I appreciate you too. Stay tapped in. So we're picking up at, man. Let's go. We're picking back up at the origin story. All right. I remember, um, remember I sat with your mom one time. I think it was at your wedding. Having a conversation. And she told me how you were such a lazy child. And she told me the day you came home and told her and your father you wanted to run track. And they laughed. Let's get it right. I was not a lazy child. <laughs> I grew up in the house by myself as the only child. So where you would kind of distribute different chores to, to amongst your siblings, <laughs> I did everything. So I was raking leaves. I was uh, washing dishes, <laughs> sweeping floors. I did everything. So because it wasn't done in the manner or the quickness that she desired, and also the combination of my dad, who is, has that military background, he believed that I had to make my bed and I'm supposed to bounce a quarter off my bed and it's supposed to bounce up because that's how tight the sheets were. <laughs> so that's, that's the life I lived as a child. So to them, yes, I was very lazy. I was considered a lounge lizard. That's what they called me. And, um, but I proved them wrong. Take us back to that day, man. How old were you when you told them, mom and dad, I want to run track. Paint the picture. What was it like? I never asked them I was going to run track. My parents were good parents. And by what I mean by that is they allowed me to um, discover myself. So, man, I played saxophone growing up. I played right. piano. I played trumpet. Uh, I was on the swim team. Wow. I played baseball. I played football. Um, when, even when I was younger, um, they had me in gymnastics when I was like five or six. Mm. I modeled as a kid when I lived in New York. So I did a lot of things. The only thing that they never really opened the door was track and field to me. I remember coming home and making the, the middle school track team. And I remember holding up my jersey as I walked in the door. I was like, look. I made the team. And I remember my dad sitting there on the computer and my mom was sitting there watching some soap operas or television or news or whatever. And they looked at each other. My dad looked back and she looked at him and they just bust out laughing. Like you, your slow ass <laughs> done made the team and you have to be fast. We got to see this. <laughs> and they came to the first track meet and they saw a different me. And ever since that moment, they were my biggest fans. I, I've seen that happen. I, I kind of coach. Nah, I kind of coach. I do coach in high school. So I've seen where uh, you have a child that has a talent and the parents are not so interested. Then uh, they come to a track meeting, their child dominates. Now all of a sudden, they were. We're, we're, we're fully behind you. <laughs> the, their parents, some parents even turn into track coaches at some point, they YouTube and everything. So I definitely could understand that. So you had success in middle school. What high school did you go to? I went to two high schools. So the first high school I went to was uh, Booker T. Washington. Shout out Booker T. Washington, Pensacola, Florida. Um, I actually was in a different school district. So I had to write a letter to Tallahassee, Florida, and asked them, can I go to Booker T. Washington? And the reason why I wanted to go was because all my friends I went to middle school with, that's the school they were going to. So I wanted to go there too. And I, my explanation to the school board was, I literally lived two miles away from this school, Booker T. Washington, compared to the other school, which was almost 10 miles away from me. So I could easily walk to school every day, which they did. I was able to go to Booker T. That's where I started out that first high school at. Oh, that's good. That's good. 
Tell me about, I've heard a rumor where they said you almost in high school, I, I don't know this, but I, I can't remember who told, two people told me that they said you almost single-handedly one stayed by yourself. All right. Is that, that's a rumor. I don't know if that's true. It's true. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's from the second high school. So what happened was, you remember when I just said that I was in another school district? The irony of the situation is that school district is the second high school that I end up going to. And if I didn't leave Booker T. Washington to go to Woodham, I don't think that I would have even got noticed in track and field. Because at that point in time, Booker T. didn't have the coaching power that Woodham had. Mm. So shout out to Woodham High School that doesn't exist anymore, but all the Woodham times out there listening. So I remember I was at a track meet and the Woodham coach comes up to me and says, you look good. You look really good. Cause I'm almost beating their guys. And he said, you ever thought about switching schools? I was like, nah, not really. He's like, I think if you come over here, you have an opportunity to be able to be better. I was like, oh, I'll take the time through the summer and think about it. So then he looked my name up, found who I was, came back to me at another track meet and says, you're in our district. It's just easy for you just to get up and just come over to our, back to our school where you, where you belong. So, and he said, looking at your scores and your grades and where you're at right now, you're not college bound. I can make sure you're college bound and you get noticed athletically. So I went home, thought about it, decided with my parents that I was going to switch schools. And the rest was history. I went over there. And within my junior and senior year, I became state champion multiple times. And that year you're talking about was my senior year. And I went and did the 110 hurdles. 300 hurdles, the high jump, and the 100 meters. And I scored in all of them, if not won it. And we won by half a point. Oh, so you did win? Yeah. I went. We didn't have our even full team. All we had was me, one other sprinter. We had a uh, high jumper and a distance throw. We only had four athletes that went to state. And we won state by half a point. Where other, other teams had relays, four by one, four by fours, triple jumpers, long jumpers. They had everything. And we won with four guys. That, that possibly needs to be talked about more. That's, that's legendary for a school that doesn't exist. That's crazy. And so, you know, your, your jersey should have been up in the wrap this summer. It was. It was. <laughs> Until the school didn't exist anymore. <laughs> uh, that, is, that, is, that is crazy. So, high school was a blast for you then, man. That had to been really fun to go through that and to start to recognize that you were, uh, I guess, a super talent. It was, it was very fun. Those were some fun times for me, man. Like, uh, I was just... Ex- I was exploring my athleticism, you know, and uh, having fun with it. I wasn't even thinking about where I was going to go in college. I was watching track and field professional meets. I was emulating. I was calling myself uh, uh, Justin Green. You know what I mean? Like Maurice Green. Green. Yeah. Who did it? Who did it? Who did it? Who did you know it? what I mean? So it was, it, was, it was super fun. And then the people I was meeting, the athletes that I was competing and competing with, like, they were family, man. We had so many great stories. We had so many different fights at track meets, but we band together. We were brothers. We were a band of brothers who loved each other, cared about each other, and we wanted to see all of us succeed. You know, you got to stay. Did you break any state records? And who was your fiercest high school competitor? I'm not sure if I, I can't remember if I broke any state records, but I came out around a time where track and field was becoming amazing. So me running the 300 meter hurdles, I was around the, around the same time that Batman 
was running the 400 and 300 meter hurdles. Oh, back, back my homeboy, we from, we from downside together. Exactly. <laughs> so if I'm running a certain time, like let's say 37, 36, he was dropping like 35, 34. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. he was on a whole different level. And obviously who he became and the champion that he was through the hurdles, it was enough said. But I came along a time where it wasn't about the records. It was about getting on top of that podium. It was about making sure that people saw you. Because records are meant to be broken. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I, I did what I had to do. I made sure that I got the job done. I competed against certain people. And I got multiple state championship medals. Shout out to Bill Sean Jackson. That's Batman for everybody who don't know. Bat! Batman from Miami Central, man. Shout out to Bat. Uh, Let's go back to talk about how you said, which is important for some of our viewers. You said the coach came and talked to you and told you that he can invest into you physically to make sure. Do you think you would have been successful or college bound without that coach just with talent? Or you think you needed that coach to mold that talent by letting him do it and allowed you to further your athleticism and your um that coach by the way was uh jay cormier coach cormier god rest his soul he was a unique coach he wasn't so much a hands-on kind of coach he was more of a overseer kind of coach we would already be going through our drills at practice and he would pull up in his new camry jump out <laughs> his camry he had a little short short song he had a uh uh Either he had a, a, a hip replacement or something was wrong with his hip and he had a, a distinct walk mm. and he would walk over <laughs> and he'll say, all right, let me check you out. All right. Ear to pocket. Ear to pocket. All right. You're looking good. You're looking good. Let me see them knees. All right. Knees, knees, knees. Great, great, great. All right, guys. Y'all look great. Y'all got this? Assistant coaches? All right. I'm out of here. He'll jump back at <laughs> that camera, pull off. You'll be out of there. But the magical thing that he would do is the day of races and the meets, he would lock in with you. He would come to you and say, you know what? You world class. You ready to run. You ready to take all these guys down. In fact, you know what? You're going to run 10-3 today. And just by him saying stuff like that to me, I've never had anybody in my life tell me I was world class before him. I didn't even know what that meant. But I knew that he saw something in me that I did not see. And I wanted to see that. Mm -hmm. So every time I stepped on a track, I would go hella high water to either achieve that time or to win that race to make what he said to me right. Mm -hmm. That's good. What was your first offer for college? We all know that you're a volunteer. We know that that's where you went. But what offers did you get? And how early was those offers? Um, I but got my what, first. One second. What made you pick Tennessee? Nah, we'll see. We're, we're going to get to that. The, <laughs> first, the first offer I got was from Troy University. And it's a guy who's not there at Troy University anymore, so I can tell this story correctly. Because <laughs> if he was, he probably, they probably look at him like, you really dropped the bag? You really fumbled the ball in this one? <laughs> so he came to my house, and I'll probably be my senior year, going into my senior year, around my senior year. And um, he came to the house, Mike Cunningham. and the first thing he says, Mr. and Mrs. Gadlin, it's an honor to be here um, in the presence of future greatness of Justin Gadlin. I just have to tell you, you're probably, you're probably too good for Troy University. <laughs> but he said, at the end of the day, I want to help you make the right decisions. And from that moment of sitting down with me, and even if he didn't give a, a, a correct pitch, for Troy University, he became a lifelong family friend because he was the first person that came into our household and wasn't like, please come to our school. He was like, look, man, you are special. You, you have something that a lot of people don't have and everybody wants. So I'm just going to give it to you straight. So from that moment on, other schools, Arkansas came, they showed a whole box of different rings and said, you want a ring? Come with us. Uh, LSU was in the, in the picture. I went to LSU and um, 
They flew me out. I got flewed out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they put me in like a four or five star hotel. Uh, the coach at that time, uh, Pat Henry, picked me up in his Jaguar. We had a barbecue on his lake house. Uh, one day it rained. The girls, the, the track girls washed my clothes. Um, they just rolled out the red carpet for me. Mm. And then I went to Tennessee. Oh, man. It was the complete opposite. <laughs> I waited at the airport. Uh, the coach at that time was Vince Anderson. And he was kind of late picking me up. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as we got in the car, we closed it, uh, the door to his Jeep Cherokee and the rear view mirror falls off. <laughs> I'm like, oh, hell. <laughs> so then we pull up to the dorm. And he's like, oh, you're going to be staying here with the regular athletes. I was like, oh, this is awesome. So I go to the room. I don't even got a bed. They gave me a cot in the corner. <laughs> so I'm sleeping on a cot in the corner. And um, I remember at that point in time, one of my hosts, we went out to a party. And they left me. They left me at the party. <laughs> so I'm there just by myself, hanging out. But the next day, I had a conversation with, uh, with Coach Anderson. And he said, all I can do for you is make you the best that you desire to be. That's all I can do. I can't promise you a championship. I can't promise you a professional career after this. But if that's what you desire and you work hard for it, that's where I'm going to push you to. And for whatever reason, the way he spoke to me was so passionate. And so full of love. That was my first time I felt like I made a real adult decision. I said, regardless of all the glitz and the glam that these other schools provided for me, I wanted to, I wanted to be coached by Vince Anderson. Mm -hmm. And that's when I had to verbally decommit to LSU, which I committed to LSU. And Coach Henry didn't talk to me for two years straight, Doug. So who was at LSU at this time? Because LSU had hitters, like, back in the day, man. I remember uh, Kelly Willie. I don't know if you remember Kelly Willie. I remember Kelly Willie. Beanie Brazil. Beanie Brazil. I remember these, these guys were, like, certified riders back then. So you would have been riding with them? I would have been riding with them, theoretically. Wow. So that, I would have <laughs> been with that team. That was my class. That was, was my That was going to be... Y'all was going to win multiple NCAA championships with that. You're right. We would have won multiple, but that's okay. I, I won a couple with uh, Tennessee. <laughs> I won a couple with Tennessee. So it still worked out in my favor. Yeah, facts, facts, facts. Uh, talk about that first year at Tennessee, man. I mean, you're a freshman. You came in. Who were your training partners? What was it like? Do you know you was going to rise to the top that freshman or sophomore year, that next year? Or what was it like? Did you, was it hard? It wasn't hard, man. It was an adventure. But, you know, and adventures have their ups and downs and obstacles in their way. But as long as you keep that optimistic, you know, vibe and energy, it'll pan out. Um, I saw Vince. I ran at the high school nationals, the 100 meters. And Vince didn't know I could even run 100 meters because when I was in high school, I was fast and agile. So out of all the sprinters that was on the team, we really didn't have any hurdlers. So they made me a hurdler, even though I was the fastest athlete on the team. Mm -hmm. It's a numbers game. You know how it is, points. Yeah, points, yeah. So when Vince saw that I could run and sprint, he was blown away, but he never told me. So the first week I was there at, at school at University of Tennessee, he took me to a private practice session with uh, Leonard Scott, which at that time was um, the speedster on the team, the guy. And they asked me to do a couple of start sessions by myself over and over again. And they just would sit back and watch. And they'd be like, they'd be whispering to each other. Because... I actually was recruited for, to do multi-events because I could, I could high jump 6'8". I was long jumping 24'10". I could hurdle. I could sprint. I could run relays. So I could do everything. So I was like that utility guy. 
So as soon as they saw that I had unique speed, they had an idea that I'm just going to be a dominant sprinter. So with that said, we did that. He's like, all right, you're going to be sprinting more than you're going to be doing anything else. But we still want you to do hurdles and things like that to score points. Now, mind you, the hurdles are at a different level from high school to college. And I already was already hurdling awkward when I was in high school. They used to call me the sidewinder because I would just run sideways. I would just be like, God. <laughs> um, so, so when a couple of hurdler guys from the team who were kind of upperclassmen, Hassan Stamps, Carl Jennings, who were already there, they saw me practicing going over the higher hurdle. And I just would go over so weird and awkward. And they would look at each other like, man, what is going on? Like, did they bring some like mentally challenged athletes <laughs> onto the team now? Like, what's going on? They didn't believe that I was as good as I was. And they just kept it to themselves. And I remember I ran my first 60, the indoor, of my freshman year. And I never ran 60 meters in my life. And we ran at Clemson. And I raced against some of the Clemson guys at that point in time. And they were like big and swole, like football players, right? Yeah. And I was already intimidated. And I remember the gun going off. And I was just running for my life. That's what I felt like. All I remember is my big old cubic succorneal uh, earrings and my ears just flapping. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running like that. And I come across the line. I made the automatic qualifier for my first race. I didn't, understand, I didn't understand what that even meant. All I knew was I won. That's good. Came back to Tennessee from Clemson. And the dudes came to my room. And I was like, yo, you just ran that? I let, yeah. I was like, yo. Yo. <laughs> so from that point on, like, they started believing in my talent. They started believing who I was. And from that, inspiration grew to where later on through the year, we started believing that we could win conference. We won conference indoors, won conference outdoors. We started doing the numbers. I walked in on my roommate one day, and I, I was like, what are you doing? You studying? He's like, no, nah, I'm adding up all the numbers. I think we can win nationals, NCAAs. This is a student. Yeah. <laughs> That's and, good. And we did. We won NCAAs by one point my freshman year. Was that the four by four where you like brought them back from dust till dawn? No, nah, man. That was, that was my, <laughs> that was my, that was my sophomore year. You remember when I was my freshman year where I had to battle against Kim Collins and Kim Collins false started in the 200 and all he needed to do was finish the race, get six at, at best. And TCU would have won this uh, championship. But he false started. We went out. We won. That's crazy. It's crazy. So now we had the sophomore year. You think you ran. You've, you had the NCAA in the 200, correct? That's what you did your sophomore year? Freshman year, I won outdoors. I won the one and the two. I doubled. And uh, I broke the, uh, the national 200-meter record around 1986 or something like that. Right. And well, then I came back in my sophomore year and I defended both titles. So you're a double 100 and 200-meter shot? Double-double. Double-double. Mr. Double Double. I don't even know if there's, if anybody else, is, it, it would have been, I'm not even sure, but I'm not even sure if we have anybody that did a double double. Not at that point in time. The only person that even did one double was uh, Harvey Glantz when he ran for Alabama 30 years before. So it was like a 30 year old record that I was able to, I guess, duplicate, right? But then after I left college, Walter Dix came along and then he started doing the double. So he won the one and the two. And then he won the one and the two again the next year after that. Ooh. Ooh. And I remember now. So the year you come out, what's that like? Are there whispers? A lot of phone calls to your home after you break the national record? How soon do the calls start at, hey, we want you to go pro, bro. We don't need you to go to school no more. This is what it is. <laughs> and what were your parents like? Because I'm, I'm pretty sure at this time, I'm not sure if they're familiar with 
what going pro in track and field means. Like, were they educated? Did they know what that meant? Do you guys know what you were in for? Nah, my parents didn't know none of that kind of stuff. <laughs> they, they were learning when I was learning, to be yeah. honest. They didn't know nothing about track and field when I brought that jersey home for the first time. But over time, being the great parents that they are, they were willing to learn. Mm. So they learned people's names. They learned the people who were my potential rivals. They learned what schools were good. So by me going pro, we did everything we could. We won indoor nationals. We won outdoor nationals all in two years. I won six NCAA individual titles all in two years. So what else was there really for me to do? So a lot of people anticipated I was going to turn pro. Who did you turn pro with? That's what I'm saying. How did that call happen? What was it? Somebody call you in your dorm room on your phone and say, hey, pro time. <laughs> um, I got a call. I can't remember exactly who it was, but they asked me, and they were from Nike, and they asked me and said, hey, do you, um, we know that you're considering going pro. And the moment that I said that I am going to pro, but I didn't announce it to the, to the world, I was flooded with like boxes, like boxes of gear and everything, like all came to my, my dorm or my apartment. I had so many boxes of like Nike stuff. Like all I could do was walk in my room and go to sleep. <laughs> there was boxes everywhere. And I had to give like my roommates like gear and stuff like that to tell them like, oh, shh, shh, be quiet, man. I ain't want nobody to know I'm going, think about going pro. I, I, it ain't even a thought now because I'm getting stuff. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So I'm going pro. Um, but after that, you know, I announced, I turned pro, I signed with Nike. It didn't go over too well at first with uh, University of Tennessee, uh, the AD at the time and the head coach there. I, they felt like they wanted the opportunity to throw their hat in the ring. Um, as as a representative of Adidas. Because mm. our school at that time was Adidas. And I didn't know the unwritten rule is whatever school you go to and they're sponsored by whatever uh, shoe company, they get kind of like that first rights or that first dibs. And I remember the AD at that time was like, man, just give us one more year. We're going to have everything lined up for you. It's going to be great. I ain't know within two years by myself, I generated almost $10 million for the school. I didn't know that. So they looked at me as more like the cash cow of bringing money in because you realize that Tennessee from a football aspect and any other sport wasn't doing good then. They just came off of um, Peyton Manning and then um, T. Martin mm. in, in 2001. And then I came along in 2001 and two. And then I turned pro in three. So I only had two years there. So they wanted more out of me. And I didn't give them the opportunity because we know how it is, man. Tomorrow's never guaranteed. You don't know. And they couldn't give me reinsurance that I was going to get a good deal if I got injured within the next year if I stayed in college. So I took my chance and I, I went with Nike. When you went with Nike, where'd you go? Did you... You couldn't stay in Tennessee. Where'd, where'd you go? I could. I could stay there. It wasn't, it, wasn't a, uh, it wasn't as crazy back then with the sponsor wars as it is now, you know? The thing, the reason why I left Tennessee and I left Vince is because I had a meeting with Vince and I told him, I was like, Vince, I'm going to declare to go pro. And he looked at me and said, I'm proud of you. I'm glad you made a decision that's going to benefit you and your future. And we appreciate everything you've done for me, done for the team. He's, and I said, well, what does it look like me staying here, you know, and, and, and working with you? And at that point in time, there was a couple other professional athletes that were hanging around who used to run for Tennessee. And some days I'll see them get disgruntled because either Vince or any other coach that was supposed to help train them, they would either be late or they wouldn't even show up. So they would leave the track, storm off, whatever like that. And I just want to get clarification to make sure that, okay, if I turn pro and I stay here and I get coached by, you know, these coaches here, what is it going to look like? And he looked me in my eyes and says, 
I have priorities. And these are my priorities. My family. These kids here at University of Tennessee, and then you. He told me straight up just like that. And he says, if you're okay with that, we're okay with that. If you decide that you need better assistance or coaching, by all means, exercise that search. And I did, and we parted ways. I felt like me being new on the scene and being a, um, a, a professional athlete, I needed to make sure that I had hands-on. So I'm going into a whole realm that I know little to nothing about. I don't know how it is to be a professional athlete. I don't know what a professional schedule looks like. I don't know what professional training looks like. I don't know none of that kind of stuff. So I didn't want to go into a half-ass. So at that point in time, I got a call, and that call was from Trevor Grant, from the coach from North Carolina. And he was on the phone, like, hey. And I remember I was with my parents, and we was riding to New York City. I think I was on fall break or something like that. And I got a call. I didn't even know the number. He said, hey, do you know who this is? With his accent. And I was like, no, I don't know who this is. <laughs> He's like, yeah, man, it's Trevor, man. Okay, Trevor, who are you? <laughs> it's Trevor Graham, man. I was like, oh, oh okay, cool. Yeah, Coach Marion, a couple of people and everything like that. I was like, oh, man, that's, that's cool. That's great. He's like, yeah, man, I, I want to I wanna work with you. You know, I want to. I want to coach you. You know, I've, I've talked to Nike about it. They're cool with it. We want to go forward. I was like, well, all right, let me get my family and get back to my agents like that, and we'll discuss it later, you know? But that's how it started. That's, that's how it started. Then you just went to North Carolina and started training. Yeah. Oh, yeah. First time, North Carolina. Moved to North Carolina by myself. Had my own town home, everything, at the age of, like, 20 years old. Out there living alone by myself. So now we, we got that first contract. What's the first thing you bought when you got signed? What's the first thing you was like, Ma, Dad, I'm gonna get that. I don't gotta get it for me. I don't even care if y'all say no, because I'm gonna still get it. <laughs> still get it. <laughs> All right. It was a twofold. So with my first contract, I put a portion of money into stocks. So I bought Nike, I bought Starbucks, I bought Best Buy and Microsoft. This is back in 2003. Pause. Everybody listening? <laughs> Say it again. Your first? My first contract. You bought what? I, I put a portion away of my money into stocks. You didn't put a portion in the Porsche. You put it in the stocks. You put it in the stock. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> so then after that, it was around that time Super Bowl just happened, right? And um, Tom Brady won the Super Bowl. It might have been one of his first wins, right? We know he won like 100 of them already. <laughs> but I remember Cadillac gave him uh, a Cadillac EXT. At that point, it was like the Cadillac with the, with the bed on the back, right? Mm -hmm. And they gave that to him as a gift for winning the Super Bowl. And the, as soon as I saw that truck, I was like, that's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> so with a portion of my money... I went out and I got me a Cadillac truck. That was my, that was my gift to myself. Now, that's, that's good. So at, at this point in time, I, I want to expound into talking about financial security because it sounds like you were looking at financial security because we all know track and field has no 401k, has no type of how you spend your money, how to save your money. There's nobody really teaching that or anything else. So you putting your money in stock and trying to secure your future was very smart. Uh, what else or what kind of advice would you want to give a uh, first signing athlete out there who signed, who, who's not, who doesn't have Mama Gatlin? <laughs> I mean, at that point in time, I feel like athletes, and this, is, this, is, this can be for all sports. As athletes, we live in the moment. We think about today and maybe tomorrow. We don't think about 
a 20 year old me saying, what is a 50 year old me going to be doing? We, we live for success and thinking that we're all going to be legendary after our career is done, which is furthest from the truth. So it was probably like the second time I had a real adult moment. I said, there's no retirement here. There's nothing for me to lean back on. I'm going to make sure that I'm going to slowly start making my money grow. Or I'm going to put my mom, is going to, I'm going to put a portion of my money away. At the, every time I would get bonuses, every time I would get uh, uh, my quarterly checks, when my money would come in from my sponsors, I would put a portion of my money away. Because at that point in time, I already was, I was living in an apartment, condo. Um, I had the, had the car I wanted. I had the clothes I wanted. I'm getting, I'm getting sponsored by Nike. So I had all the clothes I wanted, the shoes I wanted. What else did I need it for? Except what? To see the money in the bank? So I just need to make sure that I had enough to sustain myself and the rest of it could be saved or I could have money that start growing on its own. Do you still have some, some of those stocks or any? Or did you grow your portfolio as you grew? Or, or did some of that portfolio help pay the lawyer fees of the million dollars? <laughs> yeah, at, as I went through my years of track and field, I grew my portfolio. So I started learning a little bit more about stocks, what was good stocks. And I would go to my financial advisor and say, hey, is this a good stock? You know, I mean, what's this? Or I heard this new store, Target's coming out. Like, is that a good thing? You know, I would, I would make sure that I would think about my future and what it looked like. Because I didn't want to do all this hard work, had nothing to show for it at the end of my career. Now, there's a story out there. I I've heard it before. I've never asked you about it. Uh, a few other people have heard it before. There's a story that when you got signed, well, not when you got signed, but in your first year of pro, you ran in Russia for like a half a million dollars and won. It was a million dollars. It was a million. <laughs> so it's a true story. It's a true story. It's I have a, a picture. Story. <laughs> I have a picture at home <laughs> from a news clipping of me holding up a check for a million dollars, and it had Dwayne, and it had uh, uh, Tim next to me, first, second, and third, and I won a million dollar jackpot. So it's a true story. Like, I won a million dollars. It was the most- An indoor race. No, it was an outdoor race. It was an outdoor race. It should have been indoors. It was 50 degrees. <laughs> That's crazy. We was lined up. We all were lined up on the line. It was an outdoor race. And it was started, I think it was like in Sept later September in oh. Russia. <laughs> so we all were like there and they was like, all right, runners, take your clothes off. And we started looking at each other like, I ain't taking my clothes off. <laughs> it's cold. Because it was so cold, you could see your breath. That's how cold it was. And I remember I took my clothes off and I was just like, and it's at the end of the season. I'm like, it's now or never, dog. So as soon as the gun went off, I just hauled ass. Like, you remember the time you ran? 10.05. 10 10.05 10 to win a million dollars, baby. 10.05 to win a million dollars. That is crazy. And I, I've never, I've heard about that story. I don't think that, that only people from that era will probably either heard about that or know about it. But I've never asked you about it. But like, it, it was like, it was a myth. Like, ain't nobody doing no race for no million dollars back then. But I guess so. It was. I mean, there was always rumors about... <laughs> what the race was for and why it was a million dollars and never happened again. Some people would say it was the Russian, Russian mob laundering money or <laughs> it was a, a, a meat that couldn't sustain itself because it was, it was, it was too, too much financial top heavy that they couldn't pay the money back or, or get another meat annually, you know? Um, but I tell you what, they rolled out the red carpet for us, man. Like any of the winners from any of the events, they gave you a cloak. I mean, this is a heavy cloak. And they had like gold threading. And they gave you a crown, like a real crown. And they put the crown on you. They put a cloak on you. And then you get on this chariot. And the chariot is pulled by like one or two horses. And all the winners would go around the track on these chariots. <laughs> it was amazing, dog. That's, that's it was amazing. Crazy. That, is, that is million dollars, boy. Listen, the Diamond League won't dare. 
<laughs> they would not. They would not put up a million dollars. Boy, you crazy? You're crazy. And th- th- here's one of the crazy things, man. Um, at that point in time, the agent that I was with, he wasn't doing me right. And then, you know, there's a lot of dirty agents out there, mm-hmm. in all in all sports. All sports. And I remember um, he was just shitting on me the whole season, dog. And I'm thinking, like, damn, dog, like. This 2003, I'm like, I just came off of doing all the stuff I did for University of Tennessee. I just came off of 2003 winning indoor worlds as a professional. So I'm like, I know I'm, I know I'm the thing. I'm the next thing coming. He was treating me like shit. Um, he wouldn't return my phone calls. It just so happened he was at that meet in Russia. He jumped out that stand like, like a superhero with a trench coat on. <sighs> My man. What's up, baby? <laughs> That's crazy. I remember, and this is probably bad timing, I remember sending him a letter of termination around that time. This dude went, took his portion of the million dollars that he, he earned, because he was technically my agent at that time, and left all my money in Russia. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, no, 100%. He left all my money. In, in Russia. Russia. Yeah, so he, he severed his part and he, he, he got on the plane back to America. He said, F you, go get your money. That's basically what he said to me. So then in walks Ronaldo Nehemiah. And uh, that's my agent from 2004 on through my whole career. He stayed with me through all my darkest times. He, he was with me through all my great times. Shout out to Ronaldo. Shout out, shout out to Ronaldo. <laughs> He, um, he got my money. He, he, didn't, he didn't physically go get my money. <laughs> Even though they asked him, and said, you want this money? Come get this money. They said, no, Ronaldo, if you go there, you're never going to come back. <laughs> 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 so at that point in time, he was working with one of the biggest agencies was Octagon. And um, they had translators that worked for Octagon. And they had a Russian translator who basically soft threatened them and said, hey, y'all need to give this money. Or it's gonna be issues. So they made the exchange, they got it. It was all good. And at that point, from that point on through my rest of my career, I rock with Ronaldo, man. Yeah, he I never was. had to go get that money. It wasn't his, it wasn't, it wasn't his. He never thought that he was getting a portion of it. He did it off of the fact that he was a good person. And he said, This is my client now. I gotta work for my client. And I gave him a portion of that money. When he got that money, I gave him a portion so of that money. So he didn't ask for it. You just was like, you ain't got this. You ain't in the trenches. I'm going to give you this money. Absolutely. We breaking right. bread together. Oh, 100%. That's, yeah. That, 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 that's love. So we in 2003 now. 2003, what champion? Was there any championships that year? I can't remember. Yeah, it was Paris. Mm. What was, was that like? What was the trials? This is your first year pro. What was the trials? And what was the... the, the, the did you make that team? So me turning pro, because you know it's always a cycle, right? right. It's every four years, you're going to have a new class of athletes coming out mm-hmm. going pro. I left two years early. So I basically, I felt like I was the only person that was out there on the circuit. Every other, every other athlete was older than me. So when I turned pro, them dudes were gunning for me, dog. They, they saw me as they beating me was making a statement. Um, the only other person I could hang with at that point in time was Allison. Because she didn't even, she didn't even go to college. She went pro right out of high school. Mm. So we the only person that was close in age. So she was like probably like 18, 17. I was like 20, going on 21, right? Um, I remember after winning indoors in 2003, going into outdoors running some good times outdoors, and then leading up to nationals in 2003, I pulled my hamstring. Pulled my hamstring, first round, 10 meters before the finish line. Were you winning? I was in contention. I think I was winning, I was in contention. It wasn't, mm. it wasn't like a full win, like I'm winning it, but I was right there. Mm. Um, after that, 
I was treated like shit, man. <laughs> By who? Uh, because a lot of people wanted me to still be a part of the team and be in the relay pool. Mm. And then other people were like, nope, we don't need them. We don't want them. And so I still went over to Paris. And I remember that whole time I sat in the stands eating baguettes and watching everyone compete. And I told myself, this will never happen to me again. <laughs> Where I belong is out there on that track. And from that moment on, I never sat in the stands again unless I wanted to. What were, what were your go-tos, man, now that, now that you pro, you vibe for that never to happen again? You know, the next year is going to be Olympic year. Nobody has a clue. You know what I mean? Maurice is, is king at this point. Maurice Green is the guy, right? So you're going in. How do you chill getting ready for next year? How do you unwind in the offseason? What, what were you doing? Two thousand between two thousand three, two thousand four. Mm -hmm. But this would be that fall around that time. Are we focusing in on? I want to win the Olympics because I remember the narrative from that year. It was when that year started to happen. That was the rise of a sophomore. The rise of a sophomore. That was the rise of a sophomore challenging Maurice Green and all the. I think it was Golden League back then. Oh, I was at every race. If you look at the pictures, I was a distant third. In most of those races, of course. <laughs> oh, they did say the only race you won that year was the Olympics. The only race I won that year was the Olympics. That is crazy. What was the Olympics? I watched those dudes go at it. Maurice being the legend that he, he is. Um, and then watching Asafa just beat up on him around the world. Crystal Palace, Paris. Every meet we went to, like, Asafa was just serving it to him. <laughs> okay. I mean, it was true. I mean, not knocking Maurice at all, but you got to realize that Maurice was winning for a long time. You know what I mean? And there was not a lot of people in that era was, that could contend with him anymore. He, he came with the new technique, the drive phase. He owned it, right? Um, and then here comes Asafa Powell, who was at a different stature. He stood at like 6'3", big. You know, you know what Asafa looks like, mm -hmm. and he's just powerful. And I mean, if you look at Asafa's technique back then, it was fucking flawless, dog. Like it was amazing watching him run. He mm -hmm. was big, powerful, but he touched the ground with just such lightness. Like, cock, 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 cock. not even that. If you if you ever was at a meet or a practice track where Asafa was, he created the term. He might not have said it himself, but many people say "pop the blocks." When you hear "pop the blocks," That's when somebody pushed the blocks back so hard, you hear it go. <laughs> you just hear it just clink, like. Clink, clink, clink. <laughs> you just hear yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that means they are really jumping out of the blocks. The only person I probably, let's say, probably popped the blocks would be Ben Johnson from, from earlier. But and he was he, jumping out the blocks. Yeah. So that's a difference. Yeah, he created that term. Yeah. If you watch him do a block start, you were intimidated immediately. Yeah. Like, you was like. <laughs> I was there. I remember. <laughs> um, I remember there's a picture, and I think it might have been from Crystal Palace, and it was a still photo of Maurice and Asafa racing to the finish line. But it was a head. It was like a head-on shot. And I remember looking how tall Asafa was running, and Maurice was next to him. He was just like hitting it, like you know how Maurice with his hands open, like ah, you know, and. Asafa looked so unfazed and unbothered. He just like was looking down as he was running, looking down at Maurice like, I got you. You know what I mean? Like, I own you. I got you. And that stayed in my mind for so long. I don't know why, but it was just like, I think because I never encountered uh, a sprinting specimen like that, that I knew that was my age. So that told me that this is the dude that I'm going to be competing against for the next couple for a very years. long time. <laughs> this is what I got to look forward to. This so, what I got to <laughs> so leading up to the Olympics, I mean, my mind was set. I'm going out there and win. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to compete. I wanted to win. Um, 
I, at that point in time, I acquired a new training partner going into the 2004 season. That was Sean Crawford. Shout out to Sean Crawford. Uh, unique dude, man. Like, if anybody was really going to intimidate you and not know that they are intimidating you, it would be Sean Crawford. I remember I walked into the gym one day and he was already there uh, working out. And he was incline benching 225 with no spotter. <laughs> and that shit was just clinking. Clink, clink, <laughs> clink. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> but, you know, the person I am and the athlete I am, I, I saw that I had to train with that. But I also had to make sure that I broke down what he brought to the table as attribute and also what his flaws were. And I had to be able to, if I wanted to be a better athlete, I had to be able to hone in on those kind of things. And over time, I became successful at it. Um, but he was one of the best training partners I've had, man. He, he was funny, crazy, and super talented. I have so many stories about Sean, man. We'll save that for another day. <laughs> another topic, man. He'll take that all day. So we had, we had the, let's get the trials. We get the trials. I think I remember watching y'all trials. Because everybody watches the U.S. trials. If you're around the world, even if you're at your own nationals, you rush back home, whether you're in the Bahamas, Trinidad, Jamaica, whatever, to watch what's going to happen at U.S. trials because you guys' trials is like two world championships or two world or two Olympics is back to back. Got to compete at a high level twice. And in every other country, you may have heats and finals, but in America, you have heats, semis, and finals, just like the World Championships or the Olympics would be. What was that like when you got there with your training partner? I think, if I can remember correctly, you, you guys, Sean was like amazing during the trials. Maurice was at the line waiting, like trading times, watching each other like, what do you ran, 9-8? Oh, I got that next round. You know what I mean? What was that like? Training with somebody who you can definitely say that is your equal um, feels great. Um, he, he was so inspiring. So when we went into... When we went into the trials, the things that he just casually would say would just hype you up. He'd be like, he'd look at you and be like, you ready to kill these motherfuckers? <laughs> <laughs> just like that. <laughs> like, you damn right ready to kill these motherfuckers. <laughs> so it would hype me up. So watching him compete, watching him go through the rounds, and then me have to come behind him and fall behind him, like, I wanted to live up to that. You know what I mean? So the trials felt like it was just a hostile takeover for us. That's what we were doing. We were coming out there to show the world we were the best, and that's what we did. So I, I actually made the cover of Track and Field News that, that year, and I was supposed to be trial. That's what it said, trial's favorite, Justin Gatlin. And then at the end, when all the dust settled, Maurice Green won the trials. But at the end of the day, we made the team, and that's mission accomplished. Live to fight another day. That's, that's what most people or most people training to do now, you see them, they go to the trials and they're like, man, we just got to get through because the big picture is to medal. You know, we, everybody will get the trials. You want to do that, but you definitely want to medal at the, at the games or the world championships. So now I remember, <laughs> I remember 2004, the Olympics coming up. You guys are in the heats. You guys are with the shenanigans. I thought it was cool because I believe we're an entertainment sport and you were entertaining, but you guys were, uh, you and Sean, with the, with the hats and the talking before the line. This is while running, winning the rounds. Like, you guys were having a conversation <laughs> like 30 meters, 20 meters before the line, going through the line. It was looked down upon. It was. It was looked down upon. For a lot of people who understand what he, what Rod's talking about, um, we went into the trials and Sean was like, let's even get to the first round, right? The night before the first round of the 100 meters, right? And as a young athlete, I was just 
so anxious just to run, man. This is the Olympics. This is what we live for. I'm here at the Olympics. We in the village. Not, a, not only am I at the Olympics, I'm at the Olympics where it started at, in Greece. We sat in that room. We laid our clothes out like it was getting ready for the first day of school. <laughs> I ain't lying, for real. And he started laying his clothes out. He was like, he's like, Jay Gat, I'm about to roll on these fools tomorrow. I was like, what you talking about, man? He's like, you see this hat right here? This hat, I'm going to turn it backwards, and it's going to be my spoiler, right? <laughs> the brim's going to be my spoiler. And then I'm going to wear the shades because that's my tinted windows because I'm blocking out all the haters. I'm like, all right, okay, cool, cool, cool. I'm thinking he just metaphor, right? <laughs> I remember sitting in the call room watching his heat on television. <laughs> and I remember him taking his clothes off and they put in the bin and then he turns back around. <laughs> he still had the hat and the glasses on, just like he said the night before. He had it backwards. I was like, oh shit, it's about to go down. <laughs> he ran and ran the smoothest 993 I've ever seen in my life, shutting it down. And then I ran my, my heat, came through 995 or something like that. And then I remember both of us grabbing our stuff, putting our clothes back on, walking to the bus. And at that point in time, uh, the head coach for the team was George Williams. And I remember George Williams running up to us. Hey, 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 you motherfuckers, come here real quick. <laughs> <laughs> we turned around. He's like, he's like, what the hell are y'all doing out there, man? <laughs> Sean, they trying to kick you out the Olympics. They really was trying to kick him out the Olympics, bro. Because you don't realize that the teams, every team has to turn in a sheet that shows what your clothes of your team is wearing and what they're going to compete in. Mm. Hats and sunglasses were not on that list. So when he ran, George Williams had to go to Kinko's in Athens, Greece, and Photoshop a hat and a pair of sunglasses onto the official picture. Just to keep him in the Olympics. <laughs> Just to keep him in the Olympics. True story. <laughs> And that's how hats and sunglasses are a part of our Olympic team because of Sean Crawford in that race. Sean, shout out to Sean. <laughs> you changed the whole dynamic changed. of what a uniform is. So, so that didn't <laughs> stop right there. He already mad at us, right? <laughs> so obviously the next day is the semis. So we still on our shenanigans. So we both end up in the same semis. And gun goes off, we run in, and we about maybe 40 meters before the finish line. And just in Bolt fashion, how Bolt did in 2008, Sean is running next to me. He looks over at me and says, you ready to go to this final? <laughs> While we in full sprint. <laughs> I look over at him. Hell damn yeah, I'm ready to go. <laughs> and now you can see me just drop my hands. We running full speed. And we cross the finish line. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world, dog. And I remember we got so much blowback from that. Like, oh, you guys are disgracing the Olympic spirit. And how dare you guys do that? You should have more respect. But for whatever reason, I just felt like sometimes you got to bring that swag, man. You got to bring that energy, man. Yeah, I, think, I think we forget that, and, and, and I'm young, please don't crucify me. I think it's, we're in the sport of entertainment. Now, demoralizing your opponent is one thing. I don't think that was a demoralizing of the opponents. I think that was just energy that was felt. Even with both, I think it's his energy that demands the crowd and everything. We're in an entertainment sport. We're here to entertain. So that's what I thought it was at that point. You know what I mean? Like how Maurice did the whole the, the fire extinguisher thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was the... The sport made ESPN when he did that. Now, if he would have just ran through the line and maybe ran nine, I think he ran 988 that day or 985. I don't know if it makes ESPN, but because he did it in the fashion he did it in, it made ESPN because it was cool. Now, other people may say it wasn't, but I guarantee the majority would say that was cool. Now, back to your story. Y'all do that. Y'all walking back to the car room. What happens now? Um, coach was still mad at us, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was nothing we could do at that point in time. I mean, 
we were controlling our own destiny. Who's to say that we were going to make the next Olympics? So you live for the moment. Like I said earlier, as an athlete, we live for the moment. Maybe the next day. So that's what we felt like doing. That's what our heart was told us to do. So we went out there and did it. You know? So we just had to get ready for the next day, next round. We made it through. Nobody was disqualified. Got ready for the finals. That final, the epic final, because you, you have three Americans, you, Sean, Maurice, Safa, Okwenu. Who else was in that final? I think it's Aziz, Aziz Akar, I think. And Aziz then, uh, Akar. Yeah. And then, uh, was it Obadeli? Obadeli, Ob I think, was in yeah, there. I think he was in there. was in there. Uh, I think that's it, really. Isn't it? Hold on. How many is that? That's eight. Yeah. That's eight. They say on your marks, what's going through your head? Let's get, let's, before we even get there, dog, <laughs> you understand, and people at home who watch it, who understand track and field, they only let you on the track maybe five minutes before your race. And they give you a, a countdown. So they'd be like, gentlemen or ladies, y'all have four minutes to set your blocks up, get a couple of push outs and then get behind the blocks and we're gonna roll call your names, right? Not that day. They let us come out literally 15 minutes before our race. And then they start playing this like very popular Greek song. So it's like, na 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 na. Na 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 na. So the whole crowd is getting into it. The whole stadium is like clapping and getting with this, right? So we're warming up on the track. And the next thing you know, it just like turns into this like party before the 100 meter Olympic finals. Everybody's clapping. Everybody's having a good time. We was out there so long. I think Sean laid on the track. <laughs> People started sitting on the, like the number cones and everything. Sean laid on the track. Uh, we was goofing off, but we just had so much time. So then when everything kind of just, that energy kind of just settled down, which was amazing, we got in the blocks. Well, we stood behind our blocks. And then uh, run us to your mark, like you asked. I remember the only thing that went through my mind was, here we go, God. Let me be victorious today. And if I'm not, let me go back to the drawing board. In the blocks, set, bah, gun goes off. And I just remember just, I feel like I was running for my life, dog. I don't remember seeing anything. I don't remember who was by me. I don't remember none of that. All I remember is I'm like 10 meters before the finish line. And you remember how close that race was? It was gold, silver, and bronze were hundreds of a second away from each other. So like 85, 84, I mean, it was 85, 86, 87. And I remember I felt like I was in a lead. And as I got closer to the finish line, I just remember this little version of myself in my head saying, we about to win the Olympics. <laughs> we about to win the Olympics. <laughs> and I come across the line. <laughs> and to this day, I still laugh at the video. Like I come across the line with so much excitement and so much shock. I just do this like little jump and I'm like, woo, woo, woo. <laughs> and I jump. Sean comes over to me. He gives me the most biggest genuine hug. He's like, I'm so proud of you, Doug. I'm so happy that you won, right? We put that hard work in together. And they put a reef on my head. Um, it was fun. It was, it, was, it was amazing. Your parents was in the stadium for the first Olympics? The parents was in the stadium. I saw them. I saw my Nike rep, everybody. Because at the end of the day, when I look back at the film and I hear like the commentators saying what they're talking about, now I could put together why the crowd was so... <sighs> because the commentator said, and Justin Gatlin wins the 100 meters. We thought he can do it, but we never thought he would do it. And I had to think about it. I was like, what does he mean by that? Then I thought, oh, I wasn't the favorite. Not alone was I not the favorite, I wasn't even the dark horse. Because at that point in time, it was Asafa was supposed to win. Yeah, yeah. Maurice was supposed to get second. And the dark horse that was supposed to upset everything was Sean Crawford. 
And all of a sudden, it was Justin Gatlin winning, Francis Obukwelu getting second, and Maurice Green getting third. And then, then it was Sean and then Asafa. I think that's how it went. So let's go back. You win the Olympics, but let's remember, you won no race that year. Prefontaine. I think if I remember, you got like second to last. Oh boy! Don't even tell. Don't even mention Prefontaine. My first year, <laughs> dog. Um, I was a part of the big campaign that they rolled out. You know, shoe companies roll out big campaigns, especially Nike. So I was the face of their campaign going into the Olympic year. So with that, all of a sudden, I walk into Prefontaine in Oregon, and I'm seeing the sides of buildings with my whole face. Like, my face is on the side of buildings. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and it just shook me, dog. I never, I never witnessed it. I never, I never thought that would be, right? And I remember getting in the race. And I remember um, there's an area that was called Cap's Corner. So all the Nike reps, all the big wigs, Phil Knight, all of them would sit there and watch all the races. And that was the first time and the last time I ever became nervous for a race. And I remember thinking, like, they're, they're really here. They're really here for me. <laughs> they're really here to watch me. <laughs> and the gun went off, and I got my ass whooped. Who I got win, Who won that person? Who won? Man, I forgot who won, man. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's hard to identify people from the back of their head because <laughs> everyone else was in front of me. <laughs> but I just remember being so distraught, losing that race. I felt embarrassed. I literally... Every time I saw one of the uh, Nike reps, I just apologized. They're like, man, stop apologizing. We still believe in you. We still behind you. So I got my shit together and I got focused. I got dialed in. Well, good thing about that, man. I, you always get dialed in from, from what I'm hearing because you always do your, your checks and balances. No matter what happened to you in your timeline, the goal is always still this. So none of all the losses that happened in between, you still always counted yourself in to be the Olympic champion, even if no one did. So that, that's a great kudos to yourself and self-belief. Um, I think what a lot of people are losing these days, because we pour, we pour more into the coaches to believe in us than us believing in our own selves. And I, I, was, I used to do that before, too, until I got older and realized that. Belief starts in you first. It has to. You know, and it's, it's an energy thing. It's a, it's a thing that's, that's visual. That a lot of people don't realize that confidence is just oozing out of you, right? That, that's why we're able to recognize when people are, are, are cocky or arrogant because it's oozing out of them already. So when people are not confident and they don't believe in themselves, it's apparent. It shows as well. So, uh, so I, I guess... Since we topped it off with that Olympic win, what, what, what was going on with your fans now? Explain that to us in, in the last bit of how, Justin, do you, did you blow up? Did you come home and everybody knew who you were? Because nobody kind of knew you were going to, but now you've won the Olympics. You're on a plane from Athens back to the United States. Do you have, when you land, what's happening? I captured lightning in the bottle. I became. I thought you meant you captured bolt in the bottle. The bolt already... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just playing. <laughs> no, I um. Within that, within that moment of winning the Olympics, and a lot of people didn't even think I was going to win the Olympics. I pretty much feel like I became a household name. When I came home to Pensacola, they rented out the Civic Center, which holds like fifty thousand people, right? And um, I had an autograph signing. And the line to get an autograph from me lasted for two hours. I feel like everybody in that city came out to see me. They passed out, they passed out posters of me, flyers. I took pictures all day. My Nike representatives were there. It was amazing. It was a great kickstart for a young athlete going into the career, knowing that sky was the, skies was the limit. And that was a, a magical, beautiful moment, not only for me, 
but for the people who cared about me and for my city. And they made a billboard saying, just in time. And I'll never forget that. Thank you.